Um, we've pretty much gone through most of the Old Testament already. I'll finish up the Old Testament right now. But hopefully you can kind of start to discern the story of the Old Testament, the, the entire narrative of it. Uh, hopefully this encourages you to, uh, to read the entire Bible uh, as, I get through, as I get through the rest of the study. Hopefully that will connect it. And it kind of gives you something, uh, a, a narrative line to hang on to, to be able to grasp the story. That way the Bible doesn't seem so disconnected sometimes. And, and, and yeah, you know, in the Old Testament, some of the books are, uh, are out of historical order, especially when you get to the prophets later. You know, and you're kind of like, I, I don't understand this. But hopefully this starts to kind of thread, you know, this thread weaves its way through everything and be able to make some sense for it. So let's go on to the second temple, okay? Uh, so the first temple was destroyed in about 587 or 586 uh, BCE or BC, depending on which one you want to use, right? <laughs> I had to use, yeah, I had to use CE in, in my church history class because that's what all the historians are using now and I'm like I'm still I still like BC you know like uh, 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 common era yeah common era okay. uh, the Jews they were released from captivity from Babylon in about 539 okay 539 BCE okay and they were released to rebuild their temple and their city okay in 536 their altar was rebuilt and the te- uh, it was it was rebuilt over the same place where the where the where the temple had once stood. We're in the book of Ezra right now. Okay, this is Ezra chapter three. Okay, and uh, the significance of rebuilding the altar was that they could again offer sacrifices to God. Okay, sacrifices could be offered to God again. Basically, they could start to live out their religion again. Okay, and two years later, a foundation for a new temple was laid. Okay, and this is Ezra chapter three verses eight through sixteen. Okay. However, the size of this temple was nowhere near Ezekiel's vision, and it was nowhere near Solomon's temple either. Okay, the size of the temple, it was so discouraging. Okay, so there, there's, there's like this double thing happening. All right, uh, when, when they, they lay out the foundation and the people gather so, uh, to celebrate, the younger generation that, that had basically been born uh, while they were in exile. Um, they saw the, the foundation, they're like, we have a temple again, yay, and they were celebrating and all types of stuff, but Ezra says that there's this older crowd who remembered the glory of Solomon's temple, and they're weeping while everybody else is celebrating. They're weeping. So you have this sort of, uh, uh, you have this, this mixed group, okay, uh, one is celebrating because they have, uh, they have at least the foundation of a temple and they're headed in the right direction, but those who remembered the old temple could only weep in the light of the former glory. And so here are the questions, right? Have, God promise, has, have God's promises failed for his people? Was God with his people or not? You know, in a, in a sense, I mean, the question, especially after, after Ezekiel leaves you longing for this huge 800 by 800 temple complex, it's basically, hey, where is that temple? Where is the restored presence of God that he promised us through the prophet? What was, what was the size of this new temple? This new temple, um, it doesn't give any dimensions. And significantly, why? Probably because this is not that temple. Yeah, because this is not that temple. But it was smaller. Okay, It was significantly smaller. So it had to have been less, uh, less than 90 by 30. Had to have been less than 90 by 30. Now, perhaps through the discouragement of the older generation or other concerns, the Jews ended up putting off the building of the house of God, and they began building their own houses instead. So this is the prophet Haggai. Okay, this is the prophet Haggai. Uh, Haggai prophesied this attitude and the abandonment uh, of God's building. Basically, he comes to them and he tells them, this is Haggai's phrase, he says, consider your ways. You're building up your own houses. You're building up your own luxury. You're building up your own comfort, and the house of God lies in ruins. Consider your ways. Whatever he told them, Zechariah also gets a vision. Zechariah and Haggai prophesied about the same time. Zechariah, with his visions, he spurs them on, and they finally do build the temple. Okay, but we need to hear God saying through these prophets, not just in an upset tone, like, "Hey, you know what's going on here? You guys are building your house, and what about my house?" We don't want to hear God that way. We need to hear God saying, "Guys, hurry up! I want to be with you guys. I want to dwell with you. Build the house." that I may dwell with you again. We need to hear God's longing to be with his people expressed through the prophets here. The people, they eventually complete the temple, but again, 
there's no recorded time of, you know, uh, there, there's no recorded celebration. There's no recorded uh, Shekinah glory filling this temple. We don't see that anywhere. And maybe the people were discouraged or whatever, uh, but uh, the, God didn't return in a sense visibly to this temple. And moreover, the hearts of this people had not changed. And the prophet Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, he leaves us in the Old Testament longing not only for a better people, but for a better temple. So now, that takes us, and this is going to forward us ahead some 400 and some years. That's going to forward us ahead to the time of Christ. Okay? Now, recall... The significance of the garden, okay, and the tabernacle and the temple, these were the places where God comes down to dwell with men, okay? These are the places where heaven and earth meet. They are the places where one went to meet with God and to get right with God. So far, God has condescended down to man in places, but in Jesus Christ, God comes down in the form of a human being. In Christ, God comes down as a man in Jesus Christ there is God walking amongst us listen to John's description I'm going to focus on the gospel of John but John's description of the person and ministry of Jesus uh, Jesus in various places in John's gospel consider first John chapter 1 verse 14 John 1 14 we read here it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, the Greek word that's translated here is dwelt. Okay, and I think in some older versions uh, it is translated this way. It says that uh, it's tran it can be uh, translated as pitched his tent or tabernacled among us. Okay? Pitched his tent or tabernacled among us. Next, consider in John chapter 1, verse 51, when Nathaniel, when he's called to Christ, remember Nathaniel, he's contemplating the mysteries of the universe underneath the fig tree, right? He's just sitting there daydreaming and doing all types of stuff. And when Jesus calls him, and Nathaniel looks at him, and, and, and uh, you know, part like, what's so special about this guy? And then Jesus tells him, you know, hey, I saw you when you were out there under the fig tree. And that's enough to blow Nathaniel's mind and go, hey, you know me, you know where I was at, you know. Uh, and and uh, he says to him here, uh, or he says, you know, hey, you know, you are the Messiah, you are the long-awaited one. And Jesus tells him this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened, and angel and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, does that sound familiar? Angels of God ascending and descending. Anybody familiar with the Old Testament? Genesis 28, Jacob's ladder. Yeah, Jesus. And he says, on who? On the Son of Man. On himself. Jesus is claiming to be the ladder, the stairway, the temple, the ziggurat that Jacob saw connecting heaven and earth. Jesus is claiming to be that temple, that ladder that connects heaven and earth so that God could be with Jacob, so that God could be with his people. In other words, it must be obvious, right? The place where God comes down to be with his people isn't really a place. It's a person. The place where God comes down to be with his people isn't a place. It is a person. The temple is a person. Listen to Jesus in John uh, chapter 2, verse 19. When he's speaking, uh, the religious leaders, uh, uh, after, after clearing the temple, they, you know, hey, man, what are you doing clearing all our stuff? You know, and he tells them, you know what? Destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. But what was he referring to, right? It, it, John says later, we figured it out in verse 21, he says later, yeah, he was referring to the temple of his body, but at that time, we didn't know what he was talking about, right? Uh, to use a fancy uh, theological phrase that we have down here, uh, John was cabezudo, right? Okay, they didn't get it. Okay, uh, but listen to D.A. Carson explain a few things here about what's going on. He says, John explains that what Jesus was really referring to in verse 19 was his own body, that body in which the Word became flesh. The Father and the incarnate Son, they enjoy unique mutual indwelling. Therefore, it is the human body of Jesus that uniquely manifests the Father, the living abode of God on earth, the fulfillment of all the temple meant and the center of all true worship over against all other claims of holy space in this temple 
the ultimate sacrifice would take place. Within three days of death and burial, Jesus Christ, the true temple, would rise from the dead. Now, the temple, it symbolized the presence of God on earth. That is all fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus said, again, destroy this temple, and he was speaking about the temple of his body. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 20, Hebrews 10, 19, uh, 19 through 20, it says this. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places. Now, what is, what is he talking about? What holy places? The places inside the temple. The holy place and the most holy place, the holy of holies. He says, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. That is, this is the Hebrew still, it says, that is through his flesh. What did the author of Hebrews just call Jesus' flesh? What part of the temple? The curtain. Yeah, he just called Jesus' body, his, his flesh. He called that the curtain. The curtain that referred to here is the curtain that separated the holy place uh, in the temple from the holy of holies where atonement was made on the mercy seat on the ark. Notice that the body of Jesus is being compared to portions of the temple in calling his flesh the curtain. Okay, so when his flesh is destroyed, so was the curtain, right, in the temple. What did it say? When Jesus died, what happened? The curtain split inside the temple. When that happened, the curtain that restricted God's presence to the Holy of Holies and that kept us out of the most holy place that's taken away. And Jesus, not only he, he not only takes us into the very presence of God, He is the presence of God. And He unleashes the presence of God into the world. G.K. Beale and Mitchell Kim, they continue this thought. They say, Jesus not only takes over the temple's role in sacrifice, but becomes the unique place for God's special revelatory presence. God began to manifest His glorious presence in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection in a greater way than it was ever manifested in Israel's old physical temple structure. Think about that, right? I mean, in a sense, Jesus, the coming of Jesus, the persons of, Je of Jesus, as ordinary as it seems, is the most glorious presence of God among us. Not a cloud, not a bunch of light, not, you know, in, in a sense here, I mean, not just like emotional feelings or things like that, not just an ecstatic experience, but Jesus himself is the most glorious presence of God among us. So permit me to bring this home just a little bit, and since kind of taking a little sort of sidestep, okay? But think about it. I mean, when we feel like we're alone, when we need comfort, when we need, you know, true security, think about it. We go to Christ, and more theologically correct, Christ comes to us. He comes to us in his own person. Jesus really is God with us. He is Emmanuel. And now the church. When Jesus prophesied the rebuilding of the temple, because he did, right? He said, destroy this and I will build it back up, okay? Uh, in Matthew 21, 42, Jesus claimed to be the cornerstone for the new temple that he would build, okay? Matthew 21, 42, Jesus claimed he would be the cornerstone for the new temple that he would build. The church, the church is the body of Christ, Okay? And in some mystical way, we are connected with Christ, who is the fulfillment of all that the temple signifies. So let's, let's put some puzzle pieces together, right? Christ, okay, his body, church, body of Christ. Christ is rebuilding his body. So what is Christ building up? Church. He's building up the church. So because of our union with Christ, the New Testament collectively calls the church the temple. Okay, listen to a few passages here. The first one is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. It says this, it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple? And here the you in Greek is plural. Okay, so Paul is speaking to the entire church. Okay, it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you 
are that temple. Listen to another one, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know, and here the you is singular, so now it's individualizing us, okay? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Next one is from 2 Corinthians 6.16. It says this. It says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? And here in context, Paul is referring to believers as the temple of God. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and be their God and they shall be my people. A couple more. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, says this. It says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit being built into a dwelling place for God. Okay, last one. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6 says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture... Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So notice here that the corporate church is referred to as the temple of God. Okay? Individual Christians are likewise referred to as the temple of God in our individual bodies. Okay? We are temples of the living God. We are called a building that is built on the apostles and the prophets. We are called a spiritual house. We are called a dwelling place for God. We are called priests of God who serve in God's temple. In Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, okay, the corporate church, right, 120 in the upper room, okay, this is where the church collectively, the, te- the new temple of God, when the Spirit comes down, what does that kind of take us back to in the old? When the glory of God filled the temple or filled the tabernacle. This is the New Testament expressed, the New Testament fulfillment of that, of God filling his temple. It's a growing temple. It's the, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, we didn't go over this part, but in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel sees a small pebble that destroys the statue of gold, silver, and bronze, and, and feet with uh, mixed clay and stuff like that. Uh, the little pebble turns into a large mountain and fills the entire earth. What is mountain language for? Temple. That's temple language in the Old Testament. What is Daniel seeing? He's seeing a small stone that crushes an empire, <laughs> that crushes an empire and fills the whole earth with a giant temple. Okay? Sorry I didn't go over that part, but that wasn't relevant to, uh, completely to, to what we did. But it's interesting information because the theme is there. Uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel 2. Yeah, it's uh, Daniel 2 and the visions there. Okay? Now, remember, okay? uh, remember that the original commission of Adam in the garden, okay, the cultural mandate, was to grow the garden temple by working it and keeping it. Now, through Christ, the second Adam, okay, the original commission is recommissioned in the, uh, to the church in the Great Commission. Okay? The original commission was to fill the, uh, to fill the earth with others made in God's image and to subdue it, right? To multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Okay? But now Jesus reinterprets, he reinterprets that original command as now go into all the earth, make disciples, teaching all that he has commanded in a sense. Now go make new priests again, <laughs> right? Basically, it's part of the original command from Genesis. It's just been reinterpreted through Christ now. So the significant redemptive historical event uh, that is in the, uh, is that since the church is corporately the temple, okay, God dwells with His people. God dwells not just with, but God dwells in 
his people. So this is a huge move, right? Abraham didn't have this, right? God didn't dwell in Abraham the way he dwells with us now. He didn't do that. You know, and a lot of times we look, we can read Old Testament, you know, the heroes of faith, and we're like, man, I wish I had a relationship with God like them. And it's like, wait a minute. We actually have a greater one than Christ. I mean, what did Jesus say about John the Baptist, right? You know what? He's the least. Or no, 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 I'm sorry. He's the greatest of all the prophets, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than him, right? Now, I know we don't like to think that somewhere out there, somebody really is the least in the kingdom of God, right? Really, up, somebody is last place somewhere out there. But even the last place Christian is greater than the greatest Old Testament prophet, John the Baptist. Because why? We have more than they did. We have more. We have God in us, not just around us or not just in a certain place. God is with us in a more permanent way. So now, let's get to the final temple. Let's wrap all this thing up here. So far, the development of the temple has gone from a garden to a tent to a building to a person, to the church. Okay, now if, we're, if, if this were a story, this would be a pretty good story so far. Okay, however, there's still a couple of loose ends to tie up. Okay, uh, some of the questions that we still have to ask. Uh, one, where is the garden that the temple and the tabernacle pointed back to? Where is the garden? Another question, big question, where is the tree of life? Where is the tree of life? Where is Ezekiel's temple? Where is that? Will the whole world be full of the glory of God? Or are we doomed, in a sense, to these sort of spiritual promises only and just kind of, well, I'll just have the presence of God with me, but we're still kind of in exile in this world. I mean, this is still a hostile world that we live in. The book that ties up all the loose ends of the New Testament from the Old Testament is the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation, I know it's often avoided uh, because it appears to be rather cryptic or it appears to be rather scary, <laughs> you know. And then so, uh, you know, if you've seen any movies that, uh, that deal with end time stuff, you know, the book of Revelation can appear rather frightening, okay. Uh, but one of the things that makes the book of Revelation so tough is that it communicates by symbols, Hey, it communicates by symbols and in language that we're not very familiar with. Okay, for many, the book of Revelation, therefore, is a closed book. It remains a closed book. For others, the book of Revelation is a fearful book revealing frightening things about the future. Okay, but the key to the book of Revelation, right? I'm going to give everybody the secret. No, because John knew this. It's not, it wasn't really a secret for the original readers. It's the Old Testament. In a sense, the key to the book of Revelation is the Bible itself. Scripture interprets Scripture. It's the Bible just interpreting the Bible, okay? Um, much of the imagery that John communicates uh, uh, through is from God's own word. A lot of it is from Daniel, from Ezekiel, from Isaiah, from the Psalms, from just about every book in the Old Testament. You can pretty much find allusions to it. You can hear echoes of the Old Testament all throughout the book of Revelation. Another help in reading the book of Revelation is to understand that the entire trinity... Okay, in the, in the opening introduction of the book, God sends, the entire Trinity sends his own greeting, and God wants us to be encouraged by this book. That is, this book is not meant so, you know, well, you can waste all your time, you know, trying to figure out the puzzle. No, God wants us to understand the book. That's why it's called a revelation. It's not called an obscuring or a hiding, okay? Um, but he wants to encourage his church because we're in battle. Okay, I mean, you read the book of Revelation. I mean, who are our enemies? Well, we have our persecutors. There's, there, were the, there was the Roman Empire back then and the Jews. Okay, there was uh, false teachers. But not only that, apparently there's a big seven-headed dragon out there that wants to get us. Okay, uh, there's this beast that comes out of the sea. There's another beast that comes out of the earth. And there's this woman walking around with a cup riding on top of this beast running around out there that wants to do us all harm. And so the book of Revelation reveals all these enemies that we have, and they're very scary enemies. John was even frightened at one of them, and one of them was uh, so shocking that he almost wanted to worship it. And um, Anyway, that's a different part of the book. But these are our enemies, and the book of Revelation is meant to provide encouragement against those enemies so that we can remain faithful. Okay? So when it comes to the temple, okay, and in tying up the themes uh, of the temple, it's going to be Revelation chapter 21, all the way through 22.5. I'm not going to read all that, okay? Uh, but that's what's going to tie up all the loose ends of the temple, okay? And 
Revelation chapter 21 all the way through chapter 22, verse 5. Okay? And so hopefully this will be the end that helps us to see that the Bible begins with the temple. And I'm going to assert also ends with the temple. All right? So let's see that. Okay? A survey of some of these passages will help us answer our questions. First, let's look at Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. Okay? Revelation 21, 1 through 3. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. So here, New Jerusalem is a fulfillment of all that the temple has consistently signified throughout the entire Bible. It is the new city of God, which covers the entire earth. This is the dwelling place of God. That's temple language, right? You know, this is the dwelling place of God established. Remember that the name of the city uh, in Ezekiel 48, 35 was what? The Lord is there. That was the name of Ezekiel's uh, his final city, final temple that he saw. And now here, the new Jerusalem that John sees is the fuller, restored Jerusalem that Ezekiel saw. Listen to Revelation 21, 6, right? And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The spring of the water of life is an allusion to the river that brought life to the Dead Sea in Ezekiel chapter 47. Now look at, you kind of read, read the Bible backwards now, right? After getting to Revelation and looking back at the Bible, what did Ezekiel see? In his own way, in his own cultural context that he understood, Ezekiel saw the river of the water of life flowing out of the temple. What did Jesus say, right? In John 7, 37, and what did he promise to the woman at the well? Drink my water, and you'll have springs welling up to eternal life. Right? Think about that. <coughs> All death, not only in human life, will be abolished. The river of the water of life signifies that life will characterize the final state of our existence in the final temple. <clears throat> Revelation 21, 9 through 14 says this. says, Then came one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away into, uh, in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates of the twelve angels, and on the gates of the names of the twelve tribes, the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the three, on the east gates, three, uh, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the lamb. Now, part of uh, part of uh, what I want to focus on here is the descriptions of the jewels. Okay, in the Old Testament, the high priests they wore a special attire that was made of gold with precious jewels. One of the things they had was what they would call the breastplate. Okay, they had the breastplate. And they had different jewels that all represented uh, one of the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, the city itself bears resemblance to the clothing of the high priest. Okay, the city itself. New Jerusalem bears resemblance to the clothing of the high priest. Now remember, too, the significance of the high priest. Why he wore that breastplate? That it represented all Israel because he was the only person who could go into the Holy of Holies. He was the only person allowed into the immediate presence of God where he would go and make atonement. The high priest was the only person who had that privilege. But now, now the city itself is adorned with the clothing of the high priest to symbolize the privilege of access to the immediate presence of God that all believers will have in the New Jerusalem. 
now the, this, uh, the presence of God that was uh, in the Old Testament only for the high priest, only for one person, now becomes available to every single citizen in the New Jerusalem. The fullness of God's people from the Old Covenant uh, Israel to the New Covenant, uh, uh, New Covenant Israel, the church, they're all present in the cities. The names of the, of the tribes and the names of the apostles all symbolize the fullness of God's people. Now, consider uh, the shape and the size of the city. This is from Revelation 21, verses 15 through 21. I said we weren't going to read it all, but apparently we are going to read it all. Okay. Uh, and the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. Okay, so you get a cube, right? Where have we seen a cube before, anybody? Holy of Holies, right? Holy of Holies is the only thing that's a cube so far that, that we've been given uh, in the Old Testament. Okay, when he measured uh, the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia, its length and width and height are equal. Okay, he also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold. Gold, gold, where has gold, gold been before? The Holy of Holies, right? In the temple, the Holy of Holies. Okay. Um, the, 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 uh, adorned with every kind of jewel, the first jasper, the second, uh, the second sapphire, the third agate, uh, emerald, onyx, carnelian, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysoprase, uh, jacinth, and amethyst. Okay, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the streets of the city were, uh, was pure gold like transparent glass. Okay, the stones that are mentioned here, okay, uh, those are the ones that went on the breastplate of the high priest with some slight differences because the, the, the names as they were called in the Old Testament time and what they were called at, uh, uh, in the New Testament time are different. But it's the same stone, just different name, just so you'll know. Okay, but anyway, but the pure gold of the city reflects the pure gold of the Holy of Holies in the temple. The size and the amount of gold in the city is clearly figurative. Okay? If, I, if I remember the measurements correctly, if you take all the gold that is at Fort Knox right now, you can make a 19-foot cube with that. Okay? This cube okay, is uh, almost 1,400 miles. That's the, the 12,000 stadium. Okay? It's almost 1,400 miles. Okay? This would put it definitely well up in the atmosphere. It would take up about, uh, a little, I think, about two-thirds of the United States, I believe, uh, 1,400 miles, okay? Now, that this is figurative, right? I mean, heaven, the final city, is not just going to be two-thirds of the United States and the rest of the world is going to be hell. This is, it, it signifies the entire cosmos. The entirety of creation has become the holy of holies. What was intended in creation happens at the end. What was intended for the entire world to be a temple has happened in the end. Revelation 21 continues. And I saw no temple. This is verse 22. Revelation 21. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light the nations will walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And the gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. there will, they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So in biblical times, and if anybody has seen like Conan the Barbarian, right, or some of these older movies, those are just what I go to, cities were usually built around temples. Okay? Cities were built around temples. Usually you put your temple in the highest place and then you built your city around there. Okay? That's pretty much what you did. Okay? But here, here's a city with no temple. Here's a city with no temple. Why? Because the entire city is the temple. The immediate access to God everywhere uh, precludes the existence of a physical building that would function as a temple. Finally, last question. Where is the garden? Where is the garden? Where is the garden? Where is the way back to Eden? And where, oh where, is the tree of life? Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5, the final loose ends of the Bible. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the city of the street, 
also on either side of the river the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, <coughs> yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Does that sound familiar? The leaves of the tree were for the healing. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So notice, there's a river running through this temple city, just like there was a river running through the Garden of Eden. Notice that along the banks of this river, there's the tree of life. Okay, And it's not just one tree. It's not just one tree of life. Okay, It's many trees of life. Again, the connection, the leaves are for, of this tree are for the healing of the nation. What did Ezekiel see? He saw trees that were for healing. The leaves will not, will not wither, the fruit will not fail, but they will bear fresh fruit each month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary, Ezekiel's temple. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. The river that Ezekiel saw is now the same river that John sees. The trees that Ezekiel saw, John tells us, was really the tree of life. So again, when one reads the Bible backwards, okay, kind of an interesting exercise, um, they call this sometimes like a second reading or a, 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 an informed, who would say, uh, at least this is my seminary class, right? You start with a naive reading, and then you become analytically informed, and then you develop a second, uh, uh, what is it, a second uh, nativity or whatever, something like that. But basically, when you read again, you can't ignore what you've read before. So in a sense, this is kind of what I mean by reading the Bible backwards, looking through Revelation, looking back uh, to Genesis, because it's hard to do it. From Genesis to Revelation, you kind of like, well, get a little lost, you know. But reading backwards, stuff starts to pull together a little bit. It starts to pull together. Okay, so when you read backwards, uh, you can see the temple goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In fact, it would not be wrong at all to assert with other scholars that the entire new creation is what the localized temple pointed to and symbolized all along. This wasn't God changing his mind as he went and like, well, let me take this in a different direction. This was always God's intention. And then what we see throughout the story of the Bible is that God always gave hints about what he wanted to do starting in Genesis. They were already there. In the beginning, there was a garden that we lost and were expelled from. We lived life east of Eden, yet uh, it, doesn't it make sense to that? What was Abraham looking for? Abraham wasn't looking for a garden. What does Hebrews say? Hebrews 11.10, it says that he was looking for a city whose designer and builder was God. He wasn't looking for a garden. Abraham even already picked up the hint. He is looking for the city of God. The implications of that are pretty rich for urbanization, right? Especially as we move along there, you know. Um, it's Jesus Christ alone who takes us into the city of God. He is the one who purchased our citizenship there by losing his own citizenship on the cross so that he could give us his. So let me close up here before I go to the Q&A. As we ponder the story of the Bible, the story of the temple can tell us the whole narrative. In the beginning, God created a grand garden temple. Through sin, we lost that temple. But God insisted on dwelling and walking with his people again so that he gave us glimpses of the work that he would accomplish in the little temples, in the tents and altars of the patriarchs, to the tabernacle, to the temple. God then came near in Jesus Christ, becoming the fullness that all the hints he gave looked forward to. Jesus Christ, he is the temple that ends all other temples. Jesus Christ is the temple that ends all other temples. If anybody tells you that they can't wait to build up another temple, they don't understand Christ. They don't understand the significance of Christ. Okay, Jesus Christ is the temple who ends all other temples temples. Jesus Christ is God's final temple. So, in case you don't see it, okay, it cost Jesus everything to be with us. It cost God 
his own son so that he could give us his own presence to be with us. And it's through that redemptive restoration he makes a church, he makes a temple for his spirit that God may dwell with his people. And one day he will bring the fullness of that temple in a new heavens and in a new earth. This is the story of the Bible through the story of the temple. God had always intended to fill the earth with his glory. There's no sin that, will, uh, that can stop that. There's no transgression that can make that not come to pass. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantee that the whole world will be full of the glory of God and we will one day be able to pray with David who longed for this but couldn't do it because he was the king and not a priest. We will be able to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And amen.